Excellent. All right. All right. I think we can go ahead and get going here. I know we wanted to try to start on time. We've got quite a few things to cover. See a number of folks getting logged in, some more folks to join us. So shall we get going out? You ready? We are ready. Uh, I am ready. I can't uh, see uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our 2022 mid-year market and economic update. I know it's been a rather, what would you say, uneventful year thus far, not much to talk about, <laughs> kind of boring. Um, yeah, right? Yeah, just kidding. <laughs> we do have a lot of things to go over. Um, so anybody who doesn't know, my name is Jason Dahl. I am a certified financial planner and a partner at AFS Financial Group. And with me is my colleague, Alp Adebeck. Alp is the founder and managing partner at AFS. Uh, also, always like to mention, I know we have a number of folks tuning in from our 401k side. And so just as a quick reminder, uh, we at AFS Financial Group operate as a separate entity from the AFS 401k retirement services team, but we collaborate on a lot of different items, especially when it comes to various financial wellness programs. Hey, Jason, hold on. I just saw a comment that somebody can't hear. So I'll ask Natalie, can you hear us right now? Uh, yep, I can hear a lot. And Perfect. All, all, all right, all thanks. Good. That might okay. be yep. to that person. Check your own settings. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be... Yeah, obviously, if anybody else is having that issue, you know, message us. Um, maybe I'll take this opportunity to um, call your attention to that chat box. You can send, uh, or there's a there's a Q and A or a chat box. The chat box you have the function of, you know, sending a message that that all panelists can choose. But there's also a drop down you can send a message direct to Alp or me or Natalie. Um, but that is where we would encourage you to ask us questions. Um, uh, so, so there's there's a little control bar with a chat feature or a Q&A feature. They both pretty much work in the same way. We will keep an eye out on those. Um, um, all right. So it looks like some other folks Somebody are else confirming they, they, yep. they can hear. Excellent. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, all right. So, so uh, for today's session, um, a series of some different J.P. Morgan charts and graphs that depict various important market and economic data will set the framework for our conversation on what really kind of what we all need to know in terms of the current financial landscape and looking forward, right? Kind of what to expect as the second half of 2022 unfolds. All right. So as I was just saying, um, please ask questions at any point, right? Using that chat or Q&A function. We're going to keep everybody's audio on mute. That's just just kind of works out cleaner that way. Uh, but ask us questions at any point. Don't feel like you need to wait for, for us to prompt you. You can ask a question about the slide or topic we're talking about or anything else on your mind. And, you know, we'll, we'll definitely monitor that and either, you know, address it right at the moment or, you know, sort of hold off if we know, hey, we're going to get to a slide that kind of addresses that um, more specifically. <clears throat> Uh, I will say probably our favorite question is, can I schedule a time to connect with you, Jason and Alp? And we definitely want to encourage you to uh, directly follow up with us after today's workshop. If you have further questions or would like to schedule a time to review a few things over Zoom or the phone or even in person these days, uh, we definitely love what we do. And the best part of what we do is connecting with people and helping you solve personal financial planning puzzles. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out. All right. So with all that said, one more just kind of preamble, I guess, disclaimer, right? The ob obligatory disclaimer that today's presentation is not meant to be a an endorsement or recommendation for any specific investments. Uh, it is for educational purposes only. Uh, and I know some folks will listen to this recording. Um, always important to note that, hey, we're giving this on July 14th. Uh, most of the slides, the data on the slides, uh, pretty much all of them, there are a couple exceptions, but pretty much all of them are as of July 11th, 2022. Um, it's always important to just kind of keep that in mind, especially if you're listening to the recording. Uh, to that point, Natalie will be downloading this and packaging it all up and getting the recording recording link sent out to everybody who is on today's webinar. Uh, please feel free to share that, forward it to anybody you think uh, may find it of interest. <clears throat> and that, I, I believe that'll probably come out early next week and get that, get that sent out. 
All right. Um, I, 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 you know, as many of you know, Warren Buffett is very quotable. <laughs> um, uh, we use a lot of a lot of Warren's uh, um, quotes, and we thought this one in particular. This is not one we've used a, a lot recently, but uh, we thought this was a good one. You know, given kind of the current market turbulence, and to me, especially, I think it, this this quote is a great reminder, kind of of perhaps the two most important things that we can all do to give ourselves a chance, right, at being successful investors. First and foremost save and invest regularly, <laughs> right? Like no, no matter what, that's really important, right? To continue to save and, and, and invest regularly. And then related to that is stay invested, right? That doesn't necessarily mean you don't make adjustments, right? That you, um, but it's almost never, right? The right move to kind of do all or nothing kinds of moves uh, with your portfolio. And we'll, we'll obviously talk more about that. Um, but also related to kind of Warren and what he's been doing, we think it's kind of telling that after several years of accumulating cash during the, the recent kind of run up in the markets over the last several years, uh, I'll say, Jason. Yeah, <clears throat> that was. In, this is inside of his holding company, Berkshire Hathaway. Wait, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, that 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 Warren has recently, in the in the last several months, started investing or deploying large portions of his cash within Berkshire Hathaway, um, and and we we sort of bring that up because, of course, one. Prices were sort of high or expensive for, for Warren's taste for quite a while. That was in large part why he was accumulating cash. He's seeing some better opportunities right now. And, and related to that, and we're kind of seeing this across the board in a lot of ways, there's a kind of a flight to quality. Um, and Warren is a big believer in this, right, that he – that now is a good time to kind of focus on good quality companies, right? That are well run, that are profitable, has have wide moats around them is a term that Warren often likes to to refer to. All these things that, that we uh, subscribe to as well. We think this is a good time to really be focused on good quality companies. Um, and, but recognizing that, hey, even if you are, are invested in a good quality company, right? It could still go down further from where we are are now and kind of Warren's comment that he has a, a similar quote where he says hey he would welcome that right if it's a company that he believes in and it's a good price now and then it goes down it gets even cheaper right that he, he kind of welcomes that right knowing that if he's investing money that is truly kind of long-term uh, focused right that the time frame is appropriate um so with that kind of kind of preamble like i said here's here's some of the uh kind of big, big topics of the day and kind of a, the structure to today's conversation. Thank you, Jason. A great intro. Uh, and so Wall Street, as many of you know, is always climbing what is called a wall of worry. There's always something that it's dealing with that whenever there's a sell off, it's typically there's a new item or a couple of items that are causing concern. And so they always say Wall Street has to climb that wall of worry today. It's a really uh, much bigger wall than it has been in the past. And so we always talk about headwinds and crosswinds. And if you look at what is impacting the markets right now, really the number one issue is inflation. And, and we always joke that just like with, when it comes to real estate, uh, location, 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 right now it's inflation, inflation, inflation. It's the <laughs> biggest headwind out there right now. And the way the Federal Reserve is trying to battle inflation is by rise, raising rates. And one of the issues is Wall Street hates the uncertainty of not knowing how high they're going to have to raise rates. So big debate out there. You know, every time the Fed talks or one of the Fed governors talk, there's new speculation as to high, how high they're going to go at the next you know, meetings. And so that uncertainty really causes a lot of the volatility. Supply chain, two and a half years into the pandemic, still disrupted. And probably one of the best examples there is if you go buy any type of uh, new car dealer lot, there are no cars there. You might see a lot of shiny cars along the front or even in the <laughs> showroom. A lot of times they're all like one and two and three-year-old cars. Uh, you know, a lot of the dealers have five, six, seven new cars. And, and on their websites, they're saying in transit right now, if you're, you're basically trying to put an order in for the car. And one of the big problems with the supply chain, China's zero COVID policy, never ending uh, 
they control a lot of the supply chain. At one point, they had shut down Shanghai, and you know, just already in the you know a year and a half, two years into a pandemic, they were still shutting down their ports, and we just are struggling to get the supply chain caught up. Right now, one of the newer issues is are we going to go into a recession? And the Feds, by raising rates, are slowing down the economy, thus slowing down demand, trying to control inflation. And if they slow it down too much, everyone's now bringing it up, well, are they going to be tapping the brakes too hard and put us into recession? I'm not really that concerned about a recession because we always make our way out of recessions. However, I will say that the traders know what the statistics are. If we do go into a recession, the market usually goes down further. So I think that's one of the topics that is causing some volatility right now. Russian, and, Ukraine, and if I will, I'll just a moment there, like one of the things that 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 you hear a lot about is this this notion of a soft landing, right? And I know that gets a lot of headlines written in a lot of articles, right? That's really kind of the combination of number two and four on this, right? Is is the Fed trying to thread the needle or you know slow the economy down through raising rates just enough to sort of touch down at a soft landing that doesn't necessarily push the economy into a recession? Thanks, Jason. Yeah. So Russia and Ukraine obviously was a big issue at the beginning part of the year kind of off on the sidelines right now. I will say though, it is the wild card. And what I mean by that is, if Russia wants to escalate the situation, they can cause further damage. If it somehow spills over out of Ukraine, that is a problem too. So I think this is like one of the unknowns and, and not many people are focused on that. So that's something that could cause problems down the road. Uh, investor sentiment, uh, we have a great slide on that coming up. But right now, I'll say consumer confidence, investor sentiment really at historic lows, which is really unusual considering it doesn't feel like things are that bad out there. But when they're doing surveys, and, they, and they, this is like a compilation of surveys, the sentiment surveys are indicating things are basically worse in people's mind than 2008, which I think is really just not warranted. Uh, I'll say we were due for a bigger pullback. We've been having sharp sell-offs for the last six, seven years with very sharp recoveries. If you think of the pandemic sell-off, most people forgot about it, but we dropped 33, 34% just in a handful of weeks. And then we recovered. We had the fastest bull market to bear market reversal in history that was followed up by the fastest bear market to bull market. The V reversal. recovery that people Absolutely. talked a lot about. So, yeah. you know, we've been due for a more traditional bear market. So the next slide is a, a great quote <laughs> by John Templeton. Their funds are Templeton funds and it's now deceased, but bull markets are born on pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism and die on euphoria. So when things are really, really bad, that's where the bull markets are born on pessimists because people are just thrown in the towel. They don't want to own stocks anymore. And as Jason mentioned, that's when Buffett basically steps up to the plate. And related to that consumer sentiment, right? Like we're <laughs> no question. And the die on euphoria. If you think of what happened in the tech bubble in 1998 and 1999, we had almost a replay of that in 2020, 2021. Uh, and probably one of the, the best symbols of that was this woman by the name of Kathy Woods. She's been running funds called the ARC funds. She was basically getting on CNBC and Bloomberg on a daily basis, talking about how great her stock selection is. And, and these stocks are just going to go through them, go to the moon. And one was Carvana, the, the used car vending and machine vending machine <laughs> you see it in, in certain cities uh carvana i'll say in my opinion was never worth 70 billion dollars that's how much the company was being valued at today it's being valued at 3.7 billion peloton i love the product it just wasn't worth 50 billion dollars that's what the company was being valued at. Now it's valued at three billion. Zoom, we're all familiar with it. Zoom basically wasn't worth 120 billion. Today it's valued at 30 billion. So you know this die on euphoria. If you think about how everybody was drawn into the markets, same thing happened in 98, 99. It was happening basically in 2020 and 2021, and then that euphoria was just too much. And a lot of people brought up this quote. 
So the market's just yeah. started rolling over. And when, when will things be reborn? <laughs> I, uh... so, so now we actually have a bunch of slides on where we are in the markets right now. So this is the S&P 500 index at inflection points. And what we're going to focus on is the forward price to earnings ratio. So on the bottom left, March 24th of 2000, that's the peak of the tech bubble. The forward PE of the market at this time was 25.2. So the higher that number, the more expensive a stock, or in this case, the entire index is, the lower the number, the cheaper a stock or an index is. So we're at 25.2. That's actually considered historically very, very expensive. You go into the middle of the page, October 9th, 2007, going into the credit crisis, the market actually wasn't that expensive. It's at 15.1. Then we sold off during that period and the market got down to a forward PE of 10.4. And that's when Warren Buffett took out that op-ed in the New York Times telling people to buy stocks. And take a look at what happened when the forward PE got really cheap. We just went on a long run, a long recovery. Look at this trend line too. Remember that trend line, but at the uh, February 19th, 2020, going into the pandemic, forward PE was 19.2 sold off, it got down to 13.3 and quickly recovered. And one of the things we like to bring up is the change in the trend line. Whenever you see a big change like this, we typically, I'll say a big change from a well-defined trend line, typically it's not sustainable. And if you take a look at what happened, market basically was getting too expensive. January 3rd, 2022, forward PE of 21.4. Not as bad as the tech bubble, but people were starting to say valuations were getting on the crazy side. And then you see where we are. We've dropped down substantially forward P of 16.1. And we're kind of back to this trend line. So a lot yeah. of times we'll go below it. And then the question is, will we kind of honor this trend line again? Will we recover when we get through this inflation scare? Next slide is a 25 year history of the forward PE on the left side, you see the tech bubble, but really a simple slide just in the middle 25 year average is 16.86. I can barely read the, the small print there, <laughs> um, but right now we're at 16.07. So the market really is reasonable compared to the 25 year average, but, and there's always a but, how much will a recession or the inflation spike affect earnings. What I mean by that, if we have a recession, if companies basically start taking a hit to profitability, we'll see the earnings portion of this low PE take a hit, which basically makes the market more expensive. So is the market also starting to price in a recession? So again, market's reasonable valuation right now. It's just a good slide on value stocks versus growth stocks. Value stocks are the you know the blue chip dividend payers. Growth stocks are the the Apples, the Amazons, uh, Netflix, Tesla, etc. When we see above this green line, if the black line is above it, that's when growth stocks are cheap. And you see for a while, growth stocks were relatively cheap between 2009 all the way up to about 2015. When you're below it, value stocks are cheap. And so right now we actually have had a recovery in value stocks. You can see by the line there. And pretty interesting to watch. The question is, how much will this continue? So what happened in uh, 2000 after the tech bubble burst, value stocks outperformed growth stocks for a couple of years. So Warren Buffett did very poorly in 98, 99 with his investments. He did really well in 2000 and 2001 while growth stocks were getting hit really hard. So just a neat little slide on possibly a change here. So this is... Uh, a little bit of history repeating itself. So it's the S&P 500 looking at the top left part of the chart. It's the P ratio of the top 10 versus the remaining stocks in the S&P 500. So if you go to the tech bubble, the largest 10 stocks on the left side of the screen, basically were dominating the market action. So they were driving all of the returns in the markets. The same thing happened on the right side of the screen in 2021 a handful of stocks, while the S&P 500 did well, really just a handful of stocks were driving 
the action and, and the top 10 stocks, if you can read the, the fine print, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, Google, Berkshire Hathaway, United Health, Johnson and Johnson's, Nvidia and Meta, which is Facebook. Uh, it's not the same top 10 that was on the tech bubble, completely different uh, <laughs> names, but it really is interesting how the chart is repeating itself. And so the question is, will you see the P ratio? So will the, will the value of these companies that really spiked in 2020 and 2021, and were really the only ones driving the action in 2021, will they kind of come back down to the rest of the market? So this is a, a good chart on where we are in terms of historical valuations. And so if you look at it on the far right side, this is the current price to earnings ratio versus the 20 year average in the market. So the market's pulled back a lot. So if we looked at this chart a year ago, it would have been substantially different. So on the far right, large growth, its current P is 21.6. The 20 year average is 18.5. And you see on the growth stocks, They've actually come down substantially. Like small cap growth right now is selling below its 20 year average current price to earnings ratio of 23.1 versus historical 20 year average of 38. So market valuations have come way down. Value stocks on the left side, they're actually selling at discounts to the 20 year average. So really fascinating. And you can see that reflected in percentages down below, right? So just as you can see that all the value, large, mid, and small trading, you know, at a discount below 100%, you know, and then the blend and growth still a little bit above their 20 year average. Yeah. So again, when you've thrown in 20 years of history, again, you can see the market's really priced fairly reasonably right now. So on a year to date basis, this is where you see a lot of damage in the growth name. So this is like the middle of the page on the top side, you can see large cap growth is actually down year to date. I think this is through July 11th. Mm -hmm. um, it's down 25.9%. So that's what was driving the action. That's the Apples, the Amazons, the Netflix, the two uh, Teslas, et cetera, down substantially. Small cap growth down 28%. Value stocks down, but not down as much. Earlier on in the sell-off, value stocks were only down a couple percent. And so the sell-off expanded and started bringing down some of the really value in this stocks. in the second quarter. Yeah. But one of the things that we like to point out, if you compare the market where we are today, a lot of people look at their statements and they're concerned about the money they've lost from the peaks. And I realize once it prints on a statement or if they're looking daily online somewhere and they see that value, people always think that's the value that I want. You know, that's and, and to never go below that, it's long, it should be locked in. <laughs> but if you think about all we've gone through since the beginning of the pandemic, what's really fascinating to me, so on the bottom left here, this is since the market peak, February of 2020, the market is actually up in almost every asset class except for small cap growth. And from the market lows, these numbers have come back a lot. They were well over 100%. The market had really rallied off those lows. But again, what I like to point out is we've gone through a lot. And if, if you think that the every valuation that prints on a statement is kind of like the, the true value that that's like your baseline, I'm going to say that's the wrong way to look at it. <laughs> the markets are actually in relatively good compared to the beginning of the pandemic. I think Jason, I'm going to pass yeah. this off to you. So, forgive the uh, <laughs> this chart. Very um, busy chart. Very busy chart. So squint a little bit, and really just want you to focus, kind of right here near the top. You see the the YTD, the year to date. All right, we're going to look across that row. And then relative to, you see, it's your, the labels on the top. So the, what we have here are the different uh, sectors within the S&P 500. Right. So on the left, energy, materials, financials and so forth. Right. All the way over to the makeup. Right. They, they contribute to 100 percent of the S&P 500. And really the point that we're kind of building up to and pointing out here. So if we start and go go right to left. Right. So the S&P 500 index through July 11 down 18 and a half percent. Look at the, the, the whether it be utilities, consumer staples, healthcare, you name it, every single one of these you see that negative. Everything has been down year to date, other than surprise, surprise, energy, right? And we've we've seen a 
energy take a hit recently, but it's still the only sector. Um, that might have been up 45 50 percent <laughs> at one point on, yeah. back substantially. All right, so this has been been a a broad based sell off um, across every every sector of the economy, every sector within um, the S and P five hundred, and we're, we're going to talk in a moment too about how how even outside of equities, right? So this is kind of the equity side of the equation. We're going to also talk about fixed income and the bonds um, returns here to date. This is so one of our favorites. Oh, so it's just a yeah, reminder please. that it really is just widespread selling and, and to some degree you just call it repricing of the market at least on a temporary basis yeah yep yep and and, and kind of to the, that earlier point we talked about we were due we really were due across most if not all of these sectors for you know kind of a a, a shakeout if you will to take take some of the froth off of the, the recent years run up in, in valuations um, so this chart, kind of building on the on the previous one, is one I'm sure many of you have seen before. We always we always like to share this this chart because it's 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 a great reminder, right, of just kind of the 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 normal action in any given year, right, of of the equity markets. And in this case, again, we're talking about the S and P 500. Um, and so just as a quick refresher, so each of the gray bar charts re represent the end of year annual return for the S&P 500, right? So here on the far left, it starts in 1980, right? And we go all the way through you know, 2021 and then year to date um, currently. And so for example, in 1980, the S&P 500 finished the year end at up 26%, okay? So you can see all the various, the various year end returns. As you can tell, right? Oh, most of the years finished the year positive. And in, in fact, 32 of the 42 years charted finished the year positive. Now, the, where I think it gets kind of really interesting is you overlay that with the red dot. And, and the, what the red dots represent is the largest intra-year decline. Okay. So if, again, for example, in 1980, even though the S&P finished the year positive 26%. At one point during the year, there was a decline of 17%. Right? And you can see, oh, wow, there's pretty much every year, there's always a, a red dot in the negative, right? Um, and in many years, it's pretty sizable. And in fact, just kind of the average of the red dots, the average intra-year drop is 14%. Now, of course, we go go here year to date, you know, we're, we're off the lows year to date. Uh, last year, right, at one point, the market was down, I'll say only 5%. And in fact, it, Right, given that the average was 14%, but even just kind of scanning across it, so you can see why I kind of emphasized only like that's kind of the unusual year, right? To be down, to have the largest entry year decline, honestly, to be less than 10% in any given year, right? It's it's very common to have, you know, 10, 12, et cetera, um, kind of sized sell-offs in any given year. And so again, just kind of a, you know, take take a big step back slide to just kind of remind ourselves, oh. Right, it, it is normal to have these kinds of, of cycles in the market. So now it's sort of sort of stepping away from just sort of the, the, the markets and taking a view of the economy. And and a lot of folks, right, GDP gets talked about a lot, right, as the as the primary sort of measure of the, the health and strength of our economy, right? Gross domestic product. And Pretty much every administration, every president, right, always sort of talks about this kind of dream of you know three, three and a half percent to GDP, right? And and yes, that that had been the norm for many years in the U.S. Um, but the reality is, as you can see on this chart, the trend growth is really this chart goes back to 01, has been about two percent, right? And uh, you know the obvious dip here, right? So the pandemic related, you know contraction, dramatic contraction in the economy. We had a, a, a similar right to the V kind of recovery we talked about in the stock market, a V kind of recovery um, for the for the economy, getting us close back to this 2%. Now, obviously that, that came as a result of a number of different things, but a big piece of it, right, was a lot of spending, a lot of stimulus <laughs> put into the economy to help bring back uh, that GDP growth. And we're going to talk a little bit about that here in just a moment. But I, I find this also very interesting, right? Just kind of a, for what it's worth, you can sort of see the components of GDP. And by far, the biggest piece of GDP is consumer spending, 
All right. It, it, for many years now, it's always, always hovered somewhere around 65 to 70 percent of our economy is about, you know, you and I going out and buying stuff or hiring people. Right. The sort of the service economy, buying stuff um, that, that that really drives it. Right. And, and thus the impact of stimulus. Right. Get money in people's hands because they're going to get it, get out and spend it and, and help help prop back up the economy. So to the to the point of all that stimulus, right, and federal finances, we get this question quite a bit, right? Well, what what's the impact of the federal debt or the or the annual deficit um, from from federal spending? So you will see sort of the components of total spending, and this is this is um, for fiscal year twenty twenty two. Fiscal year ends September thirtieth. So thank you. Yep, yep. So so October one to September thirtieth. So so we're we're in the the sort of the fourth quarter right now of the of the current fiscal year, government fiscal year. Expected total spending to be just shy of six trillion dollars, right? And you know, billion dollars here, billion dollars there. Who, who's counting? Uh, <laughs> um, all right, and you can see the various components of what goes into our 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 deficit spending. But what's Right, the the concern that a lot of people bring up is this piece of it, right? Oh, you know, right? we we bring in income from taxes, whether from income taxes, corporate taxes, Social Security, right, payroll taxes, right, sort of other sources. Oh, but we're covering about eighteen percent of this year's deficit. Well, eighteen percent of the total budget is deficit spending, right, uh, over a trillion dollars. Um, okay. Not shocking, right? Given that we're coming, you know, working our way still through a pandemic. Um, um, but even if you go pre-pandemic, and maybe that was a point you're about to make out. <laughs> I was going to say, it's just not a sustainable policy. <laughs> it's probably a great thing to do if, if the doctor gives you bad news, like, oh, go out with a flare. But uh, it's tough to sustain that. But sorry. Um, oh, yeah. But even pre kind of pre-pandemic, we were operating in a deficit. Um, spending level. Um, but the, here you can sort of see this is what gets, you know, a number of people concerned is you see this ratio, right, percentage of GDP uh, of our of, of our net debt, right? We're, 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 we're right here at the kind of World War II levels, right? And then you see sort of the forecasts. Um, take that with a grain of salt. Um, I'll say, Jason, but, that forecast has actually been getting worse as I look at this chart yeah, over yep. the past couple of years. It was more kind of trending just from, I'll call it flatlining, not getting better. But now it's they're starting to say this deficit spending is going to be around. Yep, yep. And that's troubling. And I'll also say to Jason's point, when, when he talked about that uh, 2% trend growth for the last 20 years, so take a look at this chart, right? You oh, can actually sorry. see <laughs> that that was done, right? Uh, we got 2% growth. However, we just racked up a lot of debts. And, and it wasn't just the credit crisis and the pandemic deficits. I mean, we've been in deficit spending for a long time. For a long time. Yep. And, and that was, you know, it's been an equal opportunity spending, whether you're Democrat or Republican administration. <laughs> and there's, it's been, there's been, there's been a lot of spending deficit spending. So one of the one of the, the the sort of data points that gets referenced when talking about um, kind of recession fears and, and and thinking about oh the the underlying you know health of the economy is the health of the consumer, right? We'd made that the, the point earlier that you know close to 70% of our GDP is driven by the consumer spending. And so so the the here's a, a kind of a snapshot of consumer balance sheet, the consumer balance sheets in 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 pretty good shape, right? Uh, as a result of many years of low, low interest rates, folks have been able to pay down debts. Some folks took some of that stimulus money and, and paid down debts further. Um, I'll and, say and massive refinancing too. Massive refinancing. Yep. Yep. Uh, to steal Alps line, that was, that was the gift <laughs> that kept on giving. We'll see if it comes back. Uh, these lower interest rates come back again. Um, but this this chart here in the upper right hand corner is one we, we've been tracking for many years is the the household debt service ratio right so it's so it's um, debt payments as a percentage of households disposable personal income right and you can see it peaked in fourth quarter of 07 you know, right so 13.2 percent of of sort of the average household's disposable income was being spent to pay off debt. Well, through all those massive refinancing, right, that we've talked about, just continued lowering of interest rates, folks kept refinancing. Um, you, you, you saw it, it bottomed out um, in 2021, and you've seen it creep back up directly as a result of higher interest rates, right? And, less, and I think less a little bit of that, that, that last spike down was just people not spending that much money during the pandemic while also 
you know, potentially getting stimulus money. So yeah. that's what kind of brought it down the final leg, even though a lot of that also was that I'll call it the refinancing at, you know, two to 3%, whether it's a 15 or a 30 year loan. Absolutely. So this is uh, a newer slide that JP Morgan has put out and it's basically a, a great contra indicator. So what they're showing here is consumer confidence. So whatever their formula is for tracking it, but you can look at the blue dots along the bottom. So this is when consumer sentiment is really low. So like February, you know, 1975 in the bottom left, all those lower numbers, whenever we've gotten down to those low numbers, the market has actually had great returns on a going forward basis. In other words, when people were throwing in the towel, and you know, we're talking about bull markets being born on pessimism, this is just a great example of it. Whenever things started looking really bad, that's typically when the, the markets started looking forward and we had good returns. And so right now on the bottom right, June of 2022, the consumer sentiment, basically we're saying right now, it's pretty much worse than it's been in 50 years. And I'm gonna say, I feel this economy is nowhere near that statement. I think the economy is much healthier. I think we have plenty of issues, plenty of problems. But if I look at that, you know, this, the chart Jason talked about with just the consumer balance sheet, right? I think we're in fairly decent shape, especially in the U.S. compared to the rest of the world. So just a good chart on consumer yeah. confidence and how it relates to the stock market. And I believe tomorrow they're releasing the, the next consumer confidence report. So it's a survey from the University of Michigan and it it. In, from in many cycles of the market, it's kind of an afterthought, but it's really front and center nowadays. And I believe it's it, the most up to date is getting released tomorrow. And so, labor demand, so the jobs market, this is one of the things that's driving inflation. And it's just a fairly quick chart to review. But right now, there's 1.9 jobs per every applicant out there. So, uh, you know, this is basically causing an imbalance and causing wages to go up. And so people don't know uh, where this will end. Um, we do see a lot of stories now that companies are freezing hires. Some have done some layoffs. Uh, there's obviously going to be a lot of layoffs in anything I'll call it cryptocurrency related. You've already seen that. A uh, number of the companies have uh, gone into reorg and bankruptcies and just cutting expenses to the bone. And there's probably a lot of high price talent in some of those companies. So you'll see a, a big drop there when it comes to that demand for that tech talent. But just a, a good slide to, to, to let us understand you know, the job market is driving inflation. And, and this is just a good reason why. This kind of is summarizes it all. So this is just unemployment and wages. You see on the far right, April, 2020, when we let everybody go across the country and, and you know, all the hospitality related industries, unemployment got up to 14.7% and it has come all the way down again. And what's also interesting is a lot of people have for years talked about how artificial intelligence is going to hurt the jobs market. Uh, and we're going to have people just, you know, just not need as many people, but it's been incredible. I mean, the U.S. economy has continued to grow despite a lot of AI being deployed, and we just can't get enough people to fill the workforce. And, uh, you know, what's the difference now is you can see the wage inflation for probably about 10 years when we were in investment committee meetings at 401k plans, we would talk about this, that we expected to see more wage inflation. It just never happened. And just in the last couple of years, yeah. we've seen some fairly big spikes in it. Yeah. You saw this, this, this gap here, right. Where it was just, it was odd, right. The unemployment coming down so dramatically and wage inflation just being just you know, modest. And one of the positives about wage inflation is that money will actually get spent in the economy. So if you look at when people collect wages, that just gives them more ability to spend. So to some degree, it was long overdue. The question is, where will it settle? I think people want to see it. They, they don't mind seeing it up around like 4% trend line, 
but I, I don't think they like to see it going up uncontrolled because it's just hard. And obviously don't want it to be outpaced by things like prices at the pump and prices at the grocery store, right? We won't need those to come down and wages to kind of stay and settle, settle in at some of these higher rates, but the, the you know, the, ex the expenses to come back down. Yeah. So I started at one of the big issues really is just inflation, inflation, inflation. And so, you know, the very next slide basically just talks about CPI and core CPI, core pulling out, I'll call it food and energy. And you can actually see this period from about a third of the way in, I'll call it about a 40 year run where inflation never really got out of control. And so right now we're kind of in, I'll call it, uncharted water for the last 40 years, right? We, we, the past we spiked up and then came right back down during that 40 year period. It was never sustainable. And so this one's up a lot higher than it was in the past. Uh, so this is the singular most important issue to watch. It's been a long time since we've had to deal with inflation with this high of numbers. And I'll say the main cause is really it's the supply chain, excessive stimulus, and then Russia, Ukraine, um, on top of that, causing problems in the energy market and food supply market. Ukraine supplies a lot of the wheat for Europe. Uh, and so what makes matters worse is the speculators and traders. And one of the things that I always like to point out is the market is actually different. There's a famous line, if people say it's different, walk away from the conversation, they'll say it's always the same thing. I will say in my mind for the last 10 years, the amount of computerized trading programs, we call them the algos and the quant funds that all they do is trade off of computer models. They don't look at fundamentals. They just look at price action and they don't care what market it is. They will go into it. So if a commodity price is going up, the computers will hone in on it and then they just move those prices up. If the prices are going down, they'll start betting against that market. That's why we're seeing more volatile swings. But commodities, uh, basically, when the economy started opening up around the world and people started using more commodities, so you saw major spikes in commodity prices, like lumber went up, I think it was like fourfold. But if you just look at the list of commodities, everything basically went to historical highs. But what's really interesting, in the last five to six weeks, commodities have rolled over. Mm -hmm. Dramatically. Substantially. <laughs> and a lot of the charts that I look at, they're actually at lows where they have any of the gains they've had over the last 12 months, which is when the biggest uh, portion of inflation has hit, has been reversed out. And I'll say it seems like eight out of the 10 commodities, I will say some food commodities are still high, but they are, some of them are coming down, but it's not being shown at the grocery store yet. And energy commodities are coming down. But again, as I mentioned, there's still a wild card there. Europe has to figure out how they're going to get natural gas for the winter time because that could be a problem. But even the speculation there, prices have come down, I think, easily a third on natural gas from that spike up. And so the speculators are causing a lot of this. But this is you know, really the, the biggest issue out there is what's going to happen to inflation. And so next slide is a great slide on what makes up inflation. And so this is from March 21 to, to, to basically May of 2022. So you can actually see the difference of inflation. This is when we started, I'll say if we went back the prior 12 months, it would actually be below 2% across the board. But these are the various components is how they categorize it of inflation. And you'll see a technical term here, sticky. Yep. <laughs> that's been the big question. How sticky is this inflation? <laughs> and transitory. And so that's what Jay Powell was talking about for a while. So what they're saying is energy, new and used vehicles, food at home, um, those basically are transitory. So you'll see that, you know, kind of like cyclical inflation. It can spike up just as we've seen with energy prices. And some of you might know at one point, oil actually went negative in the future futures pricing because there was just too much speculation and people that bought contracts couldn't take delivery. So they had to pay people to take the oil. We're obviously far, far away from that <laughs> now. But one that most of us understand I've brought up earlier is like new and used vehicles. There's just no cars 
on the lots. And car prices actually were really stagnant for five to 10 years, very, very little inflation. But I think over the last two years, not including 2022, I was doing a little homework a little while ago. I think on a global basis, we've produced something like 30 million less cars. I think it was like 32 million less cars. And people started wanting to buy cars once the economy opened back up. And as people moved out of the cities to out, out into the suburbs again, uh, trying to get away from, you know, I'll call it the city life and possibly the pandemic spreading more, demand for cars went up and there was just no supply out there. And so you see, you know, car inflation has caused some problems. Food at home inflation has caused problems. I know my wife, a lot of times, comes back from the grocery store holding like one bag of groceries and she'll just say, Yeah, that cost $150. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I used to get three bags. <laughs> um, things that you know they have listed as typically sticky, like restaurant, hotels, and transportation. I actually think hotel prices will come back down at some point. Um, Shelter, the one that is probably the stickiest is typically rent prices do not come back down. And that's one of the big driving forces of inflation right now. But we are seeing housing prices come down. As everybody knows, mortgage rates have actually gone up substantially. You know, we went from two to 3% to as high as basically 6% on a 30 year mortgage. And that has impacted housing prices. So hopefully, we will start seeing some of these numbers come down. There's some inflation print numbers yesterday, but they were the June numbers. A lot of the commodity price drops are actually just in the last few weeks of June and in July, you know, on a month to date basis. So people think if we keep these lower prices, we should make uh, some good headways into tamping down some of the inflation. Fed and interest rates. So this is the big debate, like how much will the Federal Reserve raise rates to slow demand, you know, thus like bringing prices down and, and rate hikes just so you know, has little impact on food and energy because those are just completely, I'll call it supply and demand driven. And if food, you know, supply goes down, prices go up because people have to feed themselves. Same thing with energy. You know, if there ends up being a, like a cut in supply, energy prices have always spiked up. But this is the 20 year history. And so I actually think this is a really interesting trend line. So if you look at from the top left to the bottom right, you can see the history of the Fed funds rate. And one of the things that's interesting, so we at the end of the tech bubble, we were, we were raising rates to slow down the economy, but then we immediately started cutting them. And that's been like a trend that has happened for a long time that they kind of overdo it on how they increase rates and they cut rates dramatically to get the economy going again, basically all the way down to 1% started increasing rates again, going into the credit crisis, credit crisis hits. And that was mostly driven by, I'll call it a lot of bad real estate related loans and, and hidden debts on just a lot of different things. But they cut rates all the way down to zero. So again, almost you know, a short period of time, like a year, year and a half after they stopped raising rates, they just cut them all the way down. And then we flatlined for a long time, raised rates nine times starting in 2015. But what most people don't realize is we actually cut rates three times prior to the pandemic. If you remember, President Trump was commenting and kind of yelling at uh, Chairman Powell that he needed to cut rates. And they actually, I don't think the Federal Reserve listens to the president's talk when they're demanding these things, mm -hmm. but they actually cut rates three times, but then they cut to zero as soon yeah. as the pandemic hit. And the point I'm bringing up here is we've been in this trend line of we just can't take higher rates. And we've raised rates while Europe basically is just starting the rate hike cycle. So you can see we've started raising rates, but a lot of the world has been at zero for a long time. And a lot of it's more in the developed economies. I tend to think that we're going to struggle raising rates. And I also think that it's going to be a much shorter rate hike cycle. And it's now starting to get priced in a little bit. I heard yesterday um, that after we got the inflation print that some people were now expecting higher rate hikes 
in the shorter term, but some people were starting to price in rate cuts in the first quarter, end of the first hey, quarter. You can see next. that with these market yeah. expectations. <laughs> right. So again, my belief is they're not going to be able to raise rates that much. I think it just hurts this economy. Uh, it clearly will kill the goose that laid the golden egg, which is the real estate market that probably kept our economy growing. If you think about uh, old infrastructure, if you get uh, low interest rate, it allows the developers to come in and actually just build, rebuild things for really, really cheap. And I think that helped us out a lot. Um, you know, the problem is we just got a little bit overheated and there's still, as you know, just a big housing shortage. That's one of the problems out there. But again, the Fed and interest rates, this line here really is important to, to try to figure out uh, where they're going to be in the long haul. Yeah. And and I, I think the, the Fed, while trying to, as we talked about earlier, uh, structure that soft landing or, or, or hit that soft landing, they've also been pretty clear that first and foremost, right, and it's about we've got to stop inflation. We've got to control inflation, right? And if that means going into a recession, I think they've pretty much said so be it, right? The the, the most important thing is getting getting inflation under control. I think they want to get the core CPI down. I think they realize, like when he was on when Jay Powell was last on Capitol Hill, getting grilled by various committees, he basically was asked the question, and he said, I, I, you know, can you does will the rate hikes affect food and energy. And he just said, no, no ability to control those prices. Yeah. And I know I already mentioned that earlier. I just wanted to reinforce yeah. that. Uh, yeah. So this is just the historical impact of the Fed tightening. I'll only spend a few minutes, on, a few seconds on this, but uh, this is just the history. We've had you know, a lot of periods in the past that we've raised hikes. This is how long the, 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 the hike cycles lasted. You know, so the last one, recent history, nine hikes took 36 months coming out of the credit crisis. I think we're going to have a very short hiking cycle here. So it'll be interesting to see this chart a year from now. But just absolutely nothing really to worry about here, but just an interesting slide. So interest rates, inflation, what I like to point out here is we've had a 40 year trend from September 30th, 1981 when Volcker, the Federal Reserve Chairman, actually put rates up through the roof to tamp down inflation. But ever since then, we've actually struggled to get prices to go up. And you know, for the last seven to eight years, the Federal Reserve has actually been more worried about deflation than inflation. So what we see here is the 10-year Treasury yields keep going lower and lower and lower. So the nominal return versus the real return. Nominal return is what they're actually paying. Like a 10-year treasury on July 11, 2022 is paying 2.99% drop from 15.8. But the real return, so inflation adjusted, it's actually negative. So if you're buying this at 3%, if inflation ends up being 7 or 8%, you're actually losing out by holding the treasury. I think this is kind of an unsustainable period. But my point I like to bring out here is we've had this 40 year cycle of, and this isn't just in the US, the treasury yields going lower. In Europe, uh, the German Bund, their 30 year treasury, it had periods that for 30, it, it, the, to get a 30 year German Bund, you were actually taking a negative return. And I'll repeat that. <laughs> you were actually locking in a loss. So if, if you bought a $100,000 German Bund, you were basically getting less than $100,000 back 30 years later. That's how we've been fighting. Uh, you know, just uh, that's, I'll say, a great indication of how there's just been virtually no inflation out there for a long period of time. And I don't know if it's globalization. That'll be interesting when we figure this out down the road. But this trend line is fascinating. And I tend to think it's going to stay on the lower side. We might have a short spike up, but I don't think it's just going to reverse out. So, so you don't necessarily think that the bond market party is over yet? <laughs> I, I, I think that maybe the party that I think we'll get a reversal back to possibly where we were. Um, but I don't think we'll go much lower. I know at times I've made comments that it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> if uh, the economy stalled and they brought mortgage rates all the way back down to where they were, um, I think we could sustain them where they were as long as we had more housing supply. But 
if we have limited housing supplies that will cause some more bubbles. Um, this is a, the next slide is a great chart on US equity outperformance. We've talked about this for a while. And so this is easy to explain on the far right. This is basically just the US markets outperforming their overseas counterparts. And over history, there's been periods where it's gone back and forth. Two of the last three cycles have been US dominant. And so people keep wondering when this will reverse out. And I'm going to say it hasn't been happening. It's surprising. Uh, one of the interesting things are is, and I'll show it on the next slide, the international markets are actually really, really very reasonably priced. So Jason, if you want to go to the next slide, this basically shows you the price to earnings ratio discount for the international markets versus the US markets. The international markets typically average about a 14% discount. Right now they're at a 28% discount. And so what we also like to point out on the right side of the screen, this actually makes it so you can actually get really good returns on dividends if you're holding some international blue chip equities. So tend to pay more dividends overseas. And right now on July 11th, they're saying it's about a 1.8% additional dividend yield on the international side. So uh, a lot of retirees like holding a portion of their portfolio in international securities, you know, if they can get three, 4% dividend yields and in theory, just maintain their principal, it really is a, a nice way to stabilize a portfolio. Uh, we talked about the supply chain. This is just a, a great slide, really easy to understand. You know, if you go back to prior to 2020 on the left side, you can see there was no supply chain constraints. And as we go to the orange and red, this is just a supply chain that is, you know, broken and just doesn't seem to be getting healed. I mentioned earlier that uh, when you see CEOs getting interviewed, they're saying things are better, but they're not all the way back. One of the things that has held up car production has been the availability of chips. And chips basically are coming into equilibrium right now. And I was listening to a podcast about a month ago. And the speaker was saying that the chip market is coming at equilibrium. And he says it will only be at equilibrium for a day. <laughs> After that, it will be an oversupply. And if you look at what the market has been doing to the chip makers and anything related to the chip makers, so the companies that actually make the, I'll call it machines that help build the chips, um, all of that has come down considerably. And um, I heard General Motors, I think maybe a couple weeks ago, they mentioned they have 95,000 cars that are fully assembled, but are missing some chips. So my guess is we're going to start seeing them and other car manufacturers start hitting the markets. Now that the chip supply is catching up, you'll see car supply starting to catch up. So again, this is what's caused a lot of the problems. I don't expect this to continue, but I will say I never expected it to last this, last this, this long. long. Alp, we did have a, a, a an added comment kind of related to the components of inflation, sort of with the shelter comment about that, you know, pointing out the rental apartment increases are a lagging indicator. Lagging meaning, right, it's looking looking backwards. We're all, you're always a month or two behind seeing that data. And, and uh, this comment is that they, they expect that, that um, will continue to be going up for some months into the future, right? But That's correct. I know, uh, I think New York City now, even though they're not fully open where, you know, Wall Street's partially back, but I think people have moved back in the cities and they've actually seen record high rents. Mm -hmm. And across the country, because there is a housing shortage still, you've actually seen, uh, I'll say once inflation hits the markets and everybody starts thinking, I wonder if I can raise rents, you see landlords raising rents. And so it is a lagging indicator. And so that's one of the ones that's gonna be a problem to get that back down because it takes a while to build an apartment building. Uh, it takes a while to build houses. So that's an issue. Now, I will say demand for houses we know is slowing up at that five, 6% mortgage rate. So also kind of related to the 
you know, inflation components. Now this one on food had a question. Um, do we have any comments on, on some of the warnings that food shortages are on the horizon due to ranchers and farmers cutting back on inventory? Um, I haven't heard much on that. Um, my understanding is the commodities there if when I look at the commodity prices, uh, if, if I, one of the great apps out there, you can download the CNBC app, CNBC app, and in it, when you go to the markets, once you download the app and you can click on a button that has markets, you can actually go into commodities and you'll, they'll, they have a great list of all the commodities. And when you click on the commodities, you can look at how they're pricing right now and how they've priced over the last year. And I've noticed that the commodities on the food side are all coming down. Some are like, I noticed sugar was still up a decent amount, but a lot of the traditional food commodities have come down substantially. And if you look at, uh, you know, things like John Deere, um, like that's come back substantially. So people are kind of getting their hands on, like, we think we have enough supply here. Again, I recognize that uh, Russia can still disrupt things, but I not, have not been as worried about that. So this is just a great slide on asset class returns. And we've talked about commodities. And so what's really interesting, so this is from 2007 to basically 2021 and 2022 year to date. But if you look at in a low inflation environment, look at the commodities in green on the bottom there. Basically, completely deflation, right? So over the history, Jason just circled, you know, from 2007 to 2021, 2.6% loss compounded every year. So that just shows you what's changed on a temporary basis. And I tend to think this it doesn't make sense to me that we're going to have commodity shortages for a prolonged period when we've always had plenty of commodities and commodity pricing has been really weak. But you can see what happens coming out of the pandemic. You know, on a year to date basis, basically, commodities are up 17%. In 2021, commodities were up 27%. Um, again, as people just were buying things again, uh, you know, if you went into Home Depot and Lowe's, like they didn't have, uh, you know, washer and dryers and, and dishwashers, like people just were spending money on their homes, no supply of things, talked about the cars, um, plenty of supply of clothing for a while because nobody was buying new clothing. So, you know, it's interesting when you think about it, but this is just a great chart of like seeing how the various asset classes have performed. And so in a declining interest rate environment, so you go from like 2010 to where I'll call it 2021 before rates started going up, one asset class that was always near the top was real estate investment trust, REITs. Because think about owning homes. When you were able to refinance, you could afford a lot more. And if you were buying apartment buildings or office buildings, you could actually buy a lot more of an office building when the rates came down. So it actually brought up the prices of the office buildings. But if you owned uh, real estate, it generally went up in a low interest rate environment. Somehow, if we're in a sustained higher interest rate environment, then you will see real estate probably come back down. And this is an interesting uh, one, large caps. Sometimes some of these charts actually show it broken down between large cap growth, large cap blend, and large cap value. And large cap growth, if the, uh, I forgot who put out that chart, but that was actually near the top for about three or four years driven by you know the Apples, the Microsofts, the- And Amazon, full of stocks. Uh, without a doubt. Uh, but just a great chart of just sh showing you that this is how the asset classes have performed over 15 years. And it's really hard to understand what can cause a shift in a shorter term, but longer term, you can see it looking in, in the rear view mirror that, oh, lower interest rate helped out REITs and crushed the commodities, right? Just uh, We just could not have any type of inflationary environment with the low interest rates. We're on the home stretch here. I know we're 
running a couple minutes over, just got a handful, a yep. couple more points to make. Yeah, so on the fixed income side of the equation, one of the things that's been really difficult about this particular market is there's been nowhere to hide. <laughs> and what we mean by that is typically in a bear market, if it's not one that's really impacting, I'll call it the credit cycle, then you see bonds do relatively well. They'll kind of counterbalance a decline in stocks, not fully. So if you have the stock market go down 15, 16%, maybe if bonds go up three or 4%. So what's been painful in 2022 while we're on this rate hike cycle is basically all bond market. The entire bond market has gone down, the entire fixed it's income. All market. red. <laughs> Right. And that really has been something that we have not experienced in the past. We had some of this in 2007 and 8, but that was because of the credit crisis and nobody knew if the bonds you were holding would actually get paid back. And so that was more credit related. Uh, we're not in any type of danger right now about hearing about much in defaults, but this is all reflecting just higher interest rates. So we think this will reverse out when the feds start cutting rates again. And to per perhaps just make sure that, right, the, the explain that the, the inversion, inverted relationship, right? If you had a two-year treasury that was paying 2% interest and now new US treasuries are paying 3% interest, well, because they raised interest rate, your your two-year that you have is now worth less, right? Like that's that's the relationship of rising interest rate environment. It'll still it, mature at the exact same value. But if you want to resell it prior to maturity, that's where you're going to have to be sell it at a discount or below. And I call it, it'll be math magic. It basically have the same return as the current one from that point forward. So it's kind of tough to explain, but it really is just market and math magic. Um, so Jason, if you want to talk about sure. risk profile. And yeah, you know, it's just one of those, you know, fundamental foundational components, right, of thinking about, okay, yeah, great. Thanks for all this information, right? What, what, do, what do I do with this, right? What's the, what's the most important thing to do is to always circle back to whether it's for you as an investor in total or even within buckets of your different investment accounts, right? Whether it's it's money you're saving long-term for retirement or maybe it's money that is for retirement, but but retirement is is now, it's here, right? Um, or, or, it's, or or there's other very short-term money. Right? It's it's always super important to sort of go through this the the risk profile you know sort of thought process and think to yourself, well, one, what's my comfort level? What's my tolerance for risk for this particular you know account or, or or pot of money? What's my need? How much need or how much risk do I need to take to achieve my goal? Right. So if it's it's money that you know the example we always say if if you have money saved in a college savings account, for example, and and you you've reached your goal, right? Hey we've got to a balance that we know is going to cover the costs for for you know juniors cost of attendance and that's happening right away well you don't need to take on any more risk right um, and then also is thinking about okay in the context of your overall planning right what's your capacity to take on risk do i have steady income do i have other sources that i can tap into if i needed to access liquidity and not be forced to sell into a down market right like these are the kinds of things that are ongoing and always you know just crucial to to under make sure you're you're prepared for and that when when we go through these cycles like we're going through now it's not an emotion uh, emotional kind of response um and then you know underlying all of that as i just said is is always important okay what's the time frame what is this money you know if i'm if i'm you know in my 40s like i am and i'm putting money into my 401k and i'm seeing it god it just feels like it's it's you know it's good money after bad right because every time contribution i put into the 401k the next day i see right this in this current market it's going down in value well i would encourage you to think of that as oh that's great right kind of to warren buffett's point of great because I, I don't need any of this money anytime soon i'm i'm able to buy at, at better prices um and then i'll be able to enjoy the recovery over the next 20 30 40 years right as i continue to work and even transition into retirement um and Jay, uh, before we go to the final thoughts natalie yeah. i just want to double check like I, I i don't know if jason picked up but i never saw like you wrote jeff's comments yeah we i that was the, i got that one you already that, that was the, okay, yeah that perfect. was the rental the rental comment 
Yep. So, you know, yep. what's next? And, and so probably the question we get, us, get asked all the time is how long will this last? And obviously nobody really knows that answer, as I mentioned, and I think everybody can, understands that it's really all about when they can control inflation. And I think once they see that getting under control, I think the markets will, will stabilize. Uh, one thing that's interesting, the market typically looks forward six to 12 months. And if you think about it right now, that's not happening. The market's really unclear as to what's going to happen. And it's kind of living in the moment. And that usually happens when there's a lot of issues the market has to deal with. But at some point, when we talk about bull markets are born on pessimism, you will notice the markets start doing better. And this happened after the credit crisis, where I know there was people that really reduced exposure to the markets during the credit crisis. And as the market was rallying coming out of that, they just didn't believe it and kept their money on the sidelines. I'm going to say that at some point, the market will start trending higher again. And you will probably won't believe it. You won't understand why it's happening, but it's because it's starting to look forward. And they're probably going to look at when the feds are going to start cutting rates again. And there's a famous line that don't fight the feds when they're cutting rates. And you could actually say this for when they were raising rates because it was hurting the markets. Uh, but when they're cutting rates, they're trying to stimulate the economy. And so, you know, that line of don't fight the feds. Uh, so at some point we expect them to get more on the accommodative side again. Is there more downside? We talked about this a little bit. It's a, the debate really is whether there's a recession in the future or not, and whether it's deep recession or a shallow recession. I think most people believe it'll be a shallow recession. I think it's being discounted, but I think the trading programs, if they start seeing a little bit more uh, evidence that the recession's deepening, they'll push the market down a little further. But I actually think that will recover quickly once the, the Fed's get aggressive on trying to be accommodative. Uh, one thing about recessions, I always like to point out, they always end. Uh, I think lower rates will return. The question is how much lower they will be. And lower rates, uh, I've had a line for years, Jason already mentioned it, I think low mortgage rates are the gift that keeps on giving. And I you know, felt it helped everybody refinance and it you know, virtually everybody I know uh, these days, uh, whether it's people we meet in seminars, webinars, or whatever, everybody will tell you that, or clients that uh, they've refinanced. If their house is not already paid off, they've refinanced to an ultra low 15 or 30 year loan, virtually no adjustable rate mortgages out there. So to, to us, we've always felt that was a very good backdrop for a long term economic expansion, because that debt service is on the low side. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind, I know it's always difficult to understand, but uh, the market is undefeated over the long haul. It has always gone on to set new highs. Tough to believe when you're going through a downturn. Uh, uh, but again, the feeling I have right now is, is, is nothing like, I'll say, the sentiment I witnessed during the credit crisis, where during the credit crisis, I mean, we used to have some people tell us, is the, you know, they would ask, is the market going to zero? Like, is it just going to completely sell out and everything's worthless? And I don't think we're anywhere near that type of sentiment. Though I will say, keep in mind, you know, you can go through periods of uh, extended market outperformance that might mean that the market performance in the future is going to be a much slower growth cycle. And that happened between 2000 and 2010. Market I also think it's, it's important, right? We always talk about like investing in the market, right? Or, or even just you know, in stocks. Well, in reality, what we're all doing, we're investing in companies, right? <laughs> we're investing in companies and to that earlier point, right? Especially investing in good quality companies, right? That, that, that have good leadership, that sell a product, <laughs> right? That people want, right? And yes, they're, price may fluctuate, but that's really, I think, kind of underlying, important to remember, right? When, oh yeah, these companies are going to survive, right? Like, yes, yeah, some some always go out of business, right? But in total, when you're investing in the market, you're investing in a, a lot of different quality companies. And a good, good uh, Warren Buffett quote to end with, <laughs> and we've used this one a lot in the past, be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. Jason already talked about uh, how Berkshire Hathaway at Buffett and his team there have actually been adding market exposure. They did it in the first quarter. Uh, even when the market had just started selling off, they saw opportunity.
strategies that they like. And the one that he's been in the news with lately, he keeps buying shares of Occidental Petroleum. I think I read yesterday or this morning, whenever it was, uh, his stake in Occidental Petroleum now is at 19%. So he's been, it's been selling off recently. He's been buying into that decline as well as other things. Well, thank you, everybody. I know we went over the hour, but as I said, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to talk about <laughs> and with the markets and the economy these days. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you sticking with us. As we said, this is being recorded. We'll get a, a link out for the recording. We have uh, recordings of, of all of our workshops. We also have a lot of other great resources um, available on our newly uh, launched, uh, refreshed website. Check us out, afsfinancialgroup.com. There is a resources page you can click on. Like I said, you can find historical blog posts, articles that we've written, handouts, market commentaries, and recordings on a lot of different a lot of different topics. So a lot of good stuff. And don't hesitate to reach out to any any of us at any time. Happy to happy or to I'll connect. Or I'll say your AFS 401k team too. So I absolutely, agree. absolutely. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, we'll leave it at that. I know we're about 15 minutes over. So everybody have a great rest of your day. Great lunch. Um, let us know if we can help you out with anything. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye everyone.